Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthias, and in the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about the security of portable storage devices and how I was able to hack some of them. Yeah. I work as an IT security consul consultant since 2007 and sometimes have a look at devices like this. Actually, concerning this research, it was uh, having yeah, a blast from the past because I did similar things uh, back in 2009, actually, and also published some security vulnerabilities back then in yeah, USB flash drives um, made by Kingston, Verbatim, and also SanDisk. I also gave a yeah, small lightning talk, I think it was four minutes, also back in 2009 uh, at the Chaos Communication Congress, about actually the same topic, but different products. Yeah, and uh, to, to make it true, um, in 2011, I also hacked some other secure crypto USB flash drives. So there's quite some history, history between me and secure portable storage devices in USB format. So the agenda of this talk will be as follows. At first, I want to give a yeah, basic overview, a short introduction about the use technology of my research project. I want to shortly present the um, research of other researchers, um, which my research is, um, of course, based um, upon. Then I want to talk about the tech surface and the tech scenarios concerning this kind of devices, so portable storage devices. It's rather easy. Then I want to talk about my research and my findings. Um, of course, the found security issues. I have also prepared two live demo attacks. We'll see if they work. Uh, and yeah, afterwards, some conclusions and recommendations. And if there is some time for Q&A, of course, Q&A. So here you can see an image of some of the devices I had a look at during this year. Um, most of the devices you can see here are by the same manufacturer or vendor, in this case, Verbatim. Yeah, and there's also a history to it. So all the devices you can see here uh, have one or more security issues uh, we're going to present. So the typical main components of secure devices like the one we've seen uh, here is, of course, some kind of storage device. Um, actually, obviously, it's NAND flash memory based. Then we have some kind of memory controller, is some kind of USB bridge controller, because we are, have USB devices. Then there is some kind of user input device, depending on the user authentication process. Um, you have either a keypad or a fingerprint sensor um, concerning my test devices, and so there is either a keypad controller in one way or another, or a fingerprint sensor controller. And sometimes there is also a spy flash memory chip for storing firmware. So here you can see one of the sample test devices. It's a Verbatim Keypad Secure. Um, we have a NAND flash memory, we have a USB to SATA bridge controller, and we have a memory controller. And yeah, that's, that's uh, most of it uh, on the one side. And on the other side, we have a keypad for our pin entry. We have a spy flash memory that contains the firmware, as we'll see later on. And we have a keypad controller for the user input. Yeah, it's a 6 to, I don't know, 12-digit passcode or 15-digit passcode that you can enter on this specific device. So all devices I have tested uh, support 256, uh, 256-bit AES hardware encryption. They all have a hardware encryption engine implemented uh, usually in the USB uh, SATA bridge controller. The user data is encrypted using uh, a disk encryption key, usually. This disk encryption key is then further encrypted using a key encryption key, and the key encryption key is derived from some kind of user input during the user authentication process, so either from the uh, entered PIN code, from a password, for instance, via client software for macOS on Windows, so I have also one example for this, or via fingerprint, using a fingerprint sensor, obviously. So on this slide, I have collected uh, yeah, some previous work of other researchers and also um, by myself, so starting back uh, one and a half decade ago, 2007. I think there is also some prior work concerning encrypted USB flash drives, but um, yeah, this is the work I was aware of and that I've also used for my research here. So, yeah, hacking crypto USB flash drives is far from new, but still possible. So here I've uh, collected some desired secure properties. I want to have this kind of device as a user. So what I want to have is that all user data is securely encrypted in one way or another. 
uh, which also means that it is not possible to deduce or infer any information by um, having a look at the um, ciphertext of the device uh, to infer information about the plain text. So this should not be possible, one property. Then only authorized users obviously should have access uh, to the sensitive data that is stored on such a device. The user authentication process in place should not be bypassable. Um, user authentication attempts, for instance, if there is a kind of password entry or pin code entry, it should be limited to a specific amount, at least concerning online boot force attacks. By online boot force attacks, um, I mean attacks against the device itself, so there's no network connection involved, but you have to have access, physical access to the uh, yeah, live device for performing this kind of attack. And what you want to have is the device to reset after a specific um, amount of consecutive failed login attempts that you have to reset or that it is completely destroyed, which is also possible for some kind of devices. And then the device integrity itself should also be protected by, yeah, hopefully secure cryptographic means. And uh, the other kind of brute force attacks, I call them also here uh, offline brute force attacks, should also not be possible. By this kind of attack, I mean you don't have to have access to the um, yeah, device itself anymore after you have extracted some uh, required data, but you perform the actual brute force attack on your own attacker-controlled machines and can do it a lot faster than, for instance, the microcontrollers that are uh, used in the device. There. And this kind of attacks um, cannot completely prevent it, in my opinion, if you have uh, the right lab and the right know-how and equipment, but you can make it very expensive and very hard for attackers. Yeah, and my research started back in December 21, last year with a customer request, and uh, in January I began to take a closer look at one specific um, of those devices I will talk uh, today. And yeah, at the first device, I was lucky and found some security issues. Then I bought similar devices, also by the same uh, manufacturer and by some other ones, and found the same and also some other security issues in further devices. And I was surprised that yeah, even in 2022, you can find some attacks that I found yeah, 13 years before. Yeah, and so I've reported the found security vulnerabilities to the affected manufacturers or respectively vendors. And yeah, next I want to talk about my test methodology and some technical stuff um, that I was capable of doing and about some things that didn't work out. So my test methodology is, I think, the same for yeah, every hardware hacking project um, people do. So there is a three part, uh, uh, there are three parts involved, the hardware analysis, firmware analysis, and software analysis. But only uh, for some devices, every part is actually required or needed because for some devices, you don't have uh, client software for Mac or Windows. Um, for other devices, it's not possible to gain access to the firmware, so you can perform this uh, analysis step. Yeah, and when performing a hardware analysis, you usually open up the device, make some pictures, try to identify all the chips, um, try to find documentation, read the documentation, understand it, find programmer manuals, finding test points, using logic analyzers, um, yeah. And if you're lucky, using some JTAG uh, debuggers, stuff like that. Uh, concerning firmware analysis, if you're lucky enough to gain access to the firmware of such a device, for instance, by dumping the firmware from the device itself by one way or another, or by downloading via support uh, website of the manufacturer, um, you can yeah, reverse engineer using uh, the firmware using yeah, static code analysis, for instance. And yeah, software analysis, the same for uh, client software components for Mac, Windows, Linux, if the device itself provides them, also using static code analysis or runtime analysis of the software. So the attack surface and attack scenarios concerning portable USB storage devices are quite limited, uh, in my opinion. So if you want to perform an attack against such a device, you have to have physical access. Um, attacks in general are possible at two different points in time. So first, before the legitimate user of the device uh, has used the device. So think of a supply chain attack in the scenario. And yeah, the second uh, point in time would be after the legitimate user has used the device, there is some sensitive data already stored on it. So for instance, the lost device or stolen device scenario, um, where we permanently remove the device from the legitimate user and try to attack it and gain unauthorized access to the um, 
content. Or maybe you're able to perform an attack where you only gain temporary physical access uh, to this USB device without the legitimate user ever knowing. Yeah, so here's with one, still one of my favorite pictures concerning supply chain attacks. It's yeah, from a news report a couple of years ago uh, concerning the tailored access operations by the NSA. And yeah, what could happen to your parcels is that someone intercepts them and tampers with your devices and then sends them along. And later on I have yeah, one attack scenario where this may be possible for some of the devices. So, and um, here is my first sample device I want to talk about. It's the Verbatim Keypad Secure. Um, here are some important features uh, that the um, manufacturer Verbatim mentions in the marketing material. It has yeah, the AES 256 bit hardware encryption, the built in keypad. It does not store any password in the computer system's volatile memory where you can extract it by means of malware, and it's compatible to yeah, PC and Mac. Um, and there is also a lockout mechanism. Um, here we can see the warning after 20 failed passcode attempts, the device will lock and initialize the USB drive. So it will reformat uh, the drive. And yeah, everything should be lost and not accessible anymore by attackers. Yeah, we've seen this picture before. So it's the front of the PCB, flash memory, USB SATA controller and a memory controller. Oh yeah, and uh, the interesting part about this, um, this is actually a SSD in M.2 form factor, so it's not soldered to the PCB, but it's uh, removable, so as you can see here. So this is a small SSD device I'm holding up here. You can just remove it, replace it. And it's also useful for attacking it later on in an external uh, root cross scenario. So here's the other side of the PCB. Um, yeah, we've always seen this picture. Uh, there's spy flash memory and a keypad controller. The spy flash memory contains the firmware of the USB to SATA bridge controller on the other side. And this keypad controller here is labeled SW611. I have no idea what this kind of chip is. Couldn't find any documentation, but it's responsible for uh, handling the pin input. So the first thing I um, found out about this device is that the device lock and reset mechanism doesn't work as yeah, marketed <laughs> by Verbatim. So yeah, when I performed manual passcode brute force attempts, so entering more than 20 consecutive failed login attempts on this device, my device didn't lock, and it also didn't lock after 30 failed attempts, and also not after, after 50 attempts. Yeah, and then I get, just gave up, tested another device, it was the same, so it simply does not work as um, yeah, proclaimed by Verbatim here. So no, no brute force protection concerning online brute force attacks, but it's still very cumbersome and slow to enter all the possible pins manually from, I think, five or six digits to 12 digits. Yeah, 12 digits, five to 12 digits. Yeah, it's here in the, the manual. So that was the first security <laughs> issue concerning this device. Um, yeah, so you can try more passcodes than you are supposed to actually do. So then I also had a look at the encrypted data of the SATA SSD in the M.2 form factor because it can simply be removed and put in another external enclosure. And here I yeah, analyzed the encrypted data and saw some obvious patterns that I did not expect. And yeah, yeah you can see it marked here. So the star means that the previous line just repeats for a um, specific number until the next hex address you can see here. And yeah, seeing such repeating byte patterns in encrypted data is always not a good sign <laughs> because um, yeah, here you can actually infer some information about the plain text only when having a look at the cipher text. But this is only true for a specific kind of data and the most famous example is, um, for example, is bitmaps. So here is the tux penguin because um, in this case, several devices, not only the Verbatim Keypad Secure, use the AES encryption mode uh, named ECB, Electronic Codebook. And here, the same 16 bytes of plain text always result in the same 16 bytes of ciphertext. And for um, some data, bitmaps or audio data in specific file formats, yeah, this can leak actual data in the ciphertext because a specific cryptographic property called diffusion is just lacking for this AES encryption mode. So this is also not very good for such a secure USB portable device. 
So the next step was a firmware analysis because I was able to simply dump the Spire Flash memory chip we've seen on the PCB using a universal programmer. I used the T56 uh, in this case, but yeah, I think any Spire Flash program that should work to actually dump the firmware. It was 128 uh, kilobytes in size, and it contains yeah, the firmware for the Initio INIC um, USB to Zelda Bridge controller. Unfortunately, no public information is available for this controller. Um, no data sheet, no programmer's manual. Yeah, so it was a black box for me. Um, but there were research publications um, by other researchers a couple of years old that had a similar device and they talked about them and reversed some of the firmware before, uh, namely the INIC uh, 3607. And I could use some of the information to yeah, perform some or um, come up with some test cases in, in this scenario and also speed up my firmware analysis. And um, one publication especially was useful, just your secure HTTP pin, we can help, by Julian Lenoir and Raphael Rigaud. Um, and I could also make great use of a Gitra um, add-on by Nicolas uh, Eos, because he implemented support for the actual um, instruction set, because um, this uh, controller used Arc Compact instruction set. I've never worked with this before, so I had to learn it. And yeah, this Gidra uh, plugin was very, very valuable, of course. So yeah, I was able to load um, the dumped firmware in Gidra and also use the decompiler in this case, which makes things a lot easier for analyzing what is going on internally. So what I also found out concerning the firmware is that it's yeah, only protected <laughs> by a simple checksum. Um, CRC 16 and X modem configuration. So I was also able to manipulate the firmware, uh, flash it to the spy flash memory, boot the device, and see what changes I could yeah, actually perform. And by this, I was able to write some own debug code and do some, some runtime analysis. Because as mentioned before, I didn't have any data sheet. I did not know how the AES engine worked of this chip. So this was very, very useful. Yeah, and of course, um, an attacker is also able with physical access to the device to just store a malicious firmware on this uh, controller and use it for his, his purposes. For instance, he could manipulate the firmware in such a way that always the same AES key is used, no matter what uh, pin code you're setting when you're initializing the device. And later on, if he gains access to your device temporarily or he steals it forever, he can simply uh, decrypt all your data. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, being able to modify the firmware was very, very useful. Um, being um, yeah, able also to patch the CRC uh, was also useful. And um, yeah, learning about Arc Compact and finding a working uh, GCC toolchain was another step that helped me uh, going forward. So what you can see here on this slide is some um, R Compact assembler code I came up with to just dump some um, memory during runtime because I was interested in how the AES engine actually worked and I was interested in where cryptographic key material was stored. And in this way, I could just came up with some educated guesses and then verify them using my own modified firmware. Yeah, and what I did here is I um, yeah, simply dumped uh, the firmware byte-wise using uh, the SPI communication because SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, was used for the um, inter-chip communication between the keypad controller and the USB to SATA bridge. And I could uh, yeah, simply reuse code that was already there and exfiltrate data by using SPI and sniffing it using a... Um, logic analyzer, because the device itself doesn't have any display. Yeah, so this was one way. Another way would have been yeah, blinking lights, but I think it's more cumbersome and this is uh, yeah, the easier way to do it. <laughs> yeah, and as already mentioned, I uh, luckily found a working um, yeah, pre-compiled GCC toolchain that could um, create uh, the correct code for this Arc compact architecture because there are also different uh, versions of it. And yeah, then I was able to dump it using my, or program it using a universal program on a SpyFlash memory chip and uh, have a go. 
What I also found out during the firmware analysis is uh, that there were some interesting, yeah, I'd say artifacts uh, left over that I've also read about in other publications. For example, there is a strange pi byte sequence that is used as initial AES encryption key concerning other devices. For ex example, uh, this one mentioned here, the Salman SMVE500. Um, but this, um, yeah, pi byte sequence, so we have three, one, four, one, five, and so on, um, was not used. It was just a leftover on this device. And um, there was also, a, I call it magic signature, that is used for the pin codes verification. And this was also the same as in other devices by other manufacturers. So there's shared firmware code between different products sold by different yeah, vendors, which is also interesting. So next up was a uh, protocol analysis concerning the interchip communication I've already mentioned um, between, the, between the USB to SATA bridge controller and the keypad controller. And here I was also able to find some interesting patterns. Um, yeah. Um, and what I found out is that the proprietary spy communication supports six different commands and at least four of them I know what they do. They initialize the device, they can unlock the device, lock the device, or change the password, and two of them, I have no clue. I didn't have a further look into them. And the protocol for me looks like this um, in its structure or the message format. Um, we have a length field, a command ID, a payload, and a checksum. The checksum, again, is uh, CRC16 in X modem configuration. Yeah, and this was also uh, quite useful because now I could see when I trigger an unlock command, what will be sent by the, uh, from the keypad controller to the USB to SATA bridge, um, and what may be used for key derivation. Because in some way or another, there is a, a key derivation for getting a key encryption key to a decrypted disk encryption key. Um, yeah, another interesting thing concerning the actual payload is that all entered passcode resulted in a 32-byte payload. The passcodes themselves, or PIN codes, are 5 to 12 digits, as we've seen in manual, but we always have uh, 32 bytes, and the last 16 bytes are always uh, FF in hexadecimal, so only half of the space is actually used. And yeah, obvious patterns could be found in the first 16 bytes of the payload, um, as we can see here. So for instance, uh, when I only enter once, so this should be... Um, 12 ones, I have repeating patterns um, consisting of four bytes each. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it uh, large enough, I have it also on another slide, but here repeating patterns again. So 111 always results in 0AC91F2F. So that's also in interesting because some kind of mapping or hashing concerning the user input has to be going on. Um, yeah, but unfortunately uh, this keypad controller is a black box and I couldn't find any information about it. So I had two ideas of uh, finding out how this ha uh, hash or mapping algorithm works. First, um, yeah, by collecting more samples for, uh, for digit inputs and analyzing them in the hope that I can understand uh, the function, or performing a hard <laughs> brute force attack just for generating all the possible uh, four digit inputs and create a large lookup table, it would be sufficient enough for an attacker yeah, who wants to gain access in this 32-bit uh, uh, scenario uh, we have here. Yeah, so I first collected manually some more samples uh, concerning user input, and here you can see some um, yeah, in this table. Um, yeah, and so I tried to collect all the possible hashes um, using um, a hardware approach. So what I did is I had a look at the encoding of the uh, different um, pins that we have on the keypad that you can see here. Yeah, then I figured out um, the different uh, or the pin out of the unknown keypad controller. And what I then tried is to desort the keypad controller, put it on a breakout board, uh, put it on a breadboard with a teensy, and then try to simulate uh, all the key presses, and then just lock the spy communication to have all the hashes. But uh, this approach failed, at least for me, because I was not able to simulate the unlock key correctly, because obviously there is some other communication going on when the unlock key is pressed, um, initiated, not by the keypad controller, but by the USB to SATA bridge, 
and I couldn't figure out what is actually going on there, so I couldn't collect um, all the possible hashes and create a lookup table by this approach. But in theory, it should be possible, but I'm missing some crucial information here. So, yeah, in act of frustration, <laughs> I tried again to find more information about this hashing or mapping algorithm. And the second time I did the web research, I got lucky because I actually um, yeah, had a search result uh, concerning the four digit input for four zeros. Yeah, and four zeros resulted um, yeah, in this value for six, uh, six and so on. And you can see here, uh, I've I found a Reddit, um, Reddit post with uh, the title integer hash function interpreter and this sounds very promising. Yeah, and indeed in this article there is um, one function described, a hash 32 shift 2002, which generates the output I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, and obviously this uh, ha integer hash function was created by Thomas Wang and uh, C implementation is rather simple and looks like this. So here I got really lucky because I have a black box, I have a function I don't know. And yeah, by um, searching in the World Wide Web, I could find the correct function at a second try. And now I had all the information uh, that were required for actually performing a brute force attack. Oh, not all. Uh, yeah, here on the slide is <laughs> the last missing part. So what I also did uh, by setting different passcodes um, on the device, I analyzed the SSD content and I found some changes in one specific sector or one specific block. Um, and this block yeah, stored the authentication information in an encrypted way. So this was the last piece I was missing for implementing a brute force attack. And yeah, the firmware analysis also showed that only the first 112 bytes are used for um, storing this kind of information. And the AES engine um, is responsible for decrypting this block and I have to correctly configure it before. And this is done by the key encryption key that is derived by the uh, pin input sent by the spy communication. And if I decrypt the, co the block correctly, I have to see the magic signature mentioned a um, few slides before, any uh, at a specific offset. And if I can see this magic signature, my derived key was correct and I found the correct uh, pin code. Yeah, so here's just a sample of a magic block in encrypted form. And yeah, the actual AES key I found out um, is simply the 32 byte payload sent from the keypad controller via spy communication. So this is the key uh, that is used for the hardware AES engine. But there was one specialty, namely the byte order. So as you can see here in this uh, pseudocode, you had to reverse the byte order for each 16 byte block. For the last one, it was not important because it was only FF. And for the first one, yeah, it was important. So I found this out by trial and error. Just uh, testing some, some different combinations. Yeah, and this was all I needed for implementing a brute forcer. And a brute forcer works in this case because the search space is rather limited. I only have five to 12 uh, digit pin codes that are supported by the firmware. Yeah, and let's try if I can do this um, also live. So yeah, what I've prepared here um, is a Windows virtual machine. And now I, I will um, attack this Verbatim keypad secure if I just insert it here, we should see nothing. So um, the device will only be unlocked if I enter the correct pin code. So if I yeah, enter some wrong pin code here and press the unlock button, nothing happens. Yeah, and the device uh, does not even show up in a USB stack of your um, operating system. So what I've done now, I've removed the um, SSD in the M.2 fab uh, form factor, I have an external enclosure for this kind of SSD device. And now I will just connect it to my Windows virtual machine. And now let's see. I didn't put it any, any screws. I hope that it has enough contacts also in this way. And yeah, here I've developed a simple tool which reads the um, hidden sectors um, at the end of the drive and after a couple of seconds. So this is a rather slow machine, it's uh, six years old, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, about seven seconds and I get a pin. 
And now I can see if this pin actually works by connecting the device again to my Windows machine. So switching to the Explorer, and now I have to enter the pin. Unlock. And now, well, we actually should have. No. My machine just froze. <laughs> so I have a green light um, here on my stick, but my virtual machine doesn't respond anymore. Hmm, yeah, that's the thing with live demos. Try to remove it. Okay, so at least not the whole machine crashed. Oh, but this one crashed, obviously. Okay, I will re reboot the machine and we'll give it another try in uh, a couple of minutes because I also have um, another. Um, no, what do I want to do? Just want to power off everything and power it again. So I will continue with the slides and try to repeat it um, yeah, later on with another one. So sorry for that, um, but it should work. And you can also come uh, after the talk to me and I will give a live presentation. <laughs> okay, so here on the slide, um, yeah, I have a backup. This is what we've seen. So I was able to actually perform brute force attack. I can get um, a passcode, and in all my attempts, the passcode was correct uh, to actually unlock the device. And this was performed on another machine, so if you have a faster machine, it's also faster, and you can also um, increase the performance of this boot force. So this was only done with a very simple AES encryption and this hash function we've seen previously. Okay, so here I have a second device um, that use uh, it functions differently. It um, doesn't use a keypad for user input, but it has a fingerprint sensor. Otherwise, it has the same um, important features, AES encryption, and should be secure. And it also has an administrative access feature using um, client software for Mac or for Windows. Yeah, so this device looks a little bit different, um, but with the same components. We have some NAND flash memory, um, again, on an M.2 form factor SSD, spy flash memory with firmware for a controller. We have memory controller, of course. Um, on the other side, we have a fingerprint sensor, we have a fingerprint sensor controller, and we have a USB to SATA bridge, and it's the same as in the other device. Uh, concerning the fingerprint sensor, I have no idea how it works. There aren't any publicly available data sheets, so this is also an interesting attack vector, possibly, but I was able to hack this device in another way, which was way simpler and not as sophisticated. So, this executive fingerprint secures supports two kinds of user authentication, um, biometric authentication via fingerprint, and also password-based uh, authentication using a specific USB communication with Windows software or Mac software. Yeah, so no public information about um, those chips that are used, and you can register your fingerprints using specific client software, and the client software also supports password-based authentication. Yeah, and here you can see the um, password-based authentication um, dialog for the administrator. So you can set an administrative password, and this password gives you access to training or register registering new fingerprints, and it also unlocks your device. So what I did here is a software analysis, because I had some Windows software and macOS software, but I only had a look at the Windows software. And what I found out is that this client software communicates with the USB storage device using yeah, um, some I.O. control SCSI pass-through commands, and that the uh, USB communication is actually encrypted. So here's an example um, in a software debugger, x64 debug in this case, and when you just set some breakpoints on the device I.O. control, Windows API, you can see the bidirectional communication, but it's yeah, not plain text, it's ciphertext because it's AES encrypted. 
Fortunately, the Windows client software is very analysis friendly, at least the BIST firmware version was, or software version was, and I had meaningful symbol names, uh, as you can see here, um, concerning AES encryption. And yeah, of course, now it's obvious where to set the breakpoints during runtime and extract um, the AES keys, and there I could also find out that hard-coded AES encryption keys are used for device communication. So now I was also able to decrypt the USB communication and just set breakpoints at the correct point in time. Yeah, and this helped me with um, configuring the next attack. Yeah, and here you can see some information that is exchanged. So Sage um, is the uh, manufacturer of the USB to SATA bridge, for instance. So yeah, I analyzed this communication of the client software and made a very interesting and also concerning observation because before even the dialog window is showed where I have to enter administrative password when starting the Windows executable, there is some communication going on and some communication with some very sensitive data. And when I had a look at the decrypted data that is going on, I found out that actually the currently set administrative password is transmitted from the device to the Windows software via USB. So that's a rather easy one, right? <laughs> yeah, so that is uh, the next demo. Um, that it's possible to unlock this secure crypto device yeah, in a rather magical way by sending a specific USB command and retrieving the correct administrative password for unlocking the device um, if you just kindly ask it to do this. Yeah, and I also had discussions if this was uh, on purpose or uh, if this was just uh, yeah, some mistake. I think it was a mistake um, that some debug code was left uh, in the actual production firmware that is sold. Yeah, but it, it can, of course, be used um, as a, a backdoor. So let's see if my machine works again. Yeah, it's, it's also quite slow. And I already got a new one, but I didn't prepare it uh, to bring it here to Brucom. <laughs> yeah, and even Windows 10 is quite demanding um, concerning resources if you want to run it in a virtual machine. So what I have here is the uh, Verbating Executive Fingerprint Secure Device. Um, if I connect this to my virtual machine, I hope it doesn't crash as before. <clears throat> no. It didn't crash, but it also didn't show the information I want to see, namely the device. So what's going on with the USB here? Where the Tim? Okay, so now it loaded it. So it, it didn't automatically pass through um, the the device because what we have here is an emulated uh, CD-ROM drive. Um, that you can see here, and here we have Mac and Windows client software, and if I open the Windows software, there is this Verbatim Secure Executable. <coughs> and when I start this Verbatim Secure Executable, we will see the logon dialog for the administrator, yeah, and here, if I know the correct password, I could gain access to the administrative interface, and here it shouldn't work. Uh, is everything is quite slow here? Yeah, but password authentication failed. And so what I did is I have written a simple tool, this one here, 
So the Robotin Fingerprint Secure Password Retriever. And if I click on the Retrieve Password button, I get the correct password. So this tool simply sends one specific USB command, gets the response, and the response contains uh, the secret password. It's automatically copied uh, to the clipboard. So if I switch back to this one here, put it in here, and uh, let's say next. What? It also failed. So the demo gods are not with me today, obviously. Hmm? Okay, that's strange. Let's try it again. I think there's some, something going on with my USB stack here because the machine hangs again, so I cannot move any, any windows. Okay, so then resort to other measures to the backup. I'm sorry for that. I hope that I can uh, also show it afterwards in a live setting. But I've also prepared um, here video. It's already available on YouTube. And what I wanted to show you is, um, yeah, you can extract the password. So where's the password? So here we've seen this dialog. Here I enter a, a wrong password. <coughs> and I'm going forward. Yeah, now we see the um, password retrieval tool that we've seen uh, a couple of minutes ago. And now I click on retrieve password, it's the same password and it's actually the same device from the video, so I'm confused why it doesn't work. <laughs> and it worked um, yeah, this morning when I tested it, but something is screwed up with my uh, virtual box setting and USB pass through. Yeah, but here you could see I could successfully um, unlock the device, then you will get another partition besides the emulated uh, CD-ROM partition, Verbatim HD. There is some sensitive data on there and you have unauthorized access to the device by yeah, gaining access there. And you can also register new fingerprints and delete existing fingerprints if you wanted to. Okay, so this is that. Uh, and yeah, I will also use the backup for <laughs> the other um, attack because I think it's, it also won't work with the keypad secure, unfortunately. So let's try, no, let's try this here. Um, yeah, I can also skip the boring stuff that you've seen previously. So it's the same attack I did a couple of minutes ago, but with screwing this time. So we have our uh, keypad CPU cracker. This step uh, still worked. <coughs> Yeah, I skip it here. So, offline boot force attack, we have the pin. It's also the same pin because it's the same device um, for this purpose. And yeah, if I assemble the device again, connect it to my PC, and then enter the correct pin with some time lapse, the obvious uh, thing should happen, namely the uh, secure partition should be unlocked and I should have an access to the sensitive data stored on it. Yeah, so in this case, it worked. <laughs> okay, so back to the slides, because I have some more, and not that much time left. So another issue uh, was data authenticity. Um, concerning this device, we've seen an emulated CD-ROM drive. Um, the image for the CD-ROM drive is also stored on the SSD in some hidden sectors. Um, yeah, and... I found out that I can also manipulate this ESO image uh, rather simply by generating my own one and just uh, storing it at the specific uh, disk offset. And what is possible here as a tech scenario is I could put malware 
on the device. I can manipulate existing files. I could uh, add some files. So here I have a malware um, access, for instance, or the verbatim secure access I could manipulate. So this can be useful for a supply chain attack. Yeah, and here is my poor hackers not targeted supply chain attack as a thought experiment. I didn't do this, but uh, one could actually buy some vulnerable devices in online shops, modify them, by adding some malware, for instance, to the ISO image or by manipulating the firmware, if he prefers to. Then he could return the modified devices within 30 days, for instance, and get his money back. And then hope that the return devices are not destroyed, but, all, uh, but resold to some users. And then he maybe have to wait for potential victims um, and could profit off of this. Yeah, and I don't know in how many uh, companies this kind of attack would actually be detected yeah. if they get a already reused uh, device that was returned, for example, to Amazon that was uh, tampered with. Okay, I will skip the other examples because they are the same, have the same issues, uh, but in a different form factor. PCBs look um, different, but are yeah, working in the same way. The same for this device. So nothing special here to see. So here's another example um, that has a different security issue. Um, yeah, Leipin EP uh, KP001, that was a device from China, also bought via Amazon. Had, of course, the strongest military technology, according to <laughs> their marketing, and also yeah, a keypad, six to 14 digit pin codes, an interesting passcode recovery feature. Um, yeah, the product website was very interesting, and that's why I bought this device, because the military grade was named there and the recovery. Um, yeah, the company website also looked interesting with enterprise honor and some certificates that at least made no sense in context of the products they are selling. So FCC for yeah, radio communication stuff. I don't know why this device should be certified by the FCC. Um, yeah, and the password recovery feature, um, there is one concerning a serial ID that is printed on there and you could send an email to this email address, so this is from a video that is contained on the drive itself when you buy it, and then you will get a dynamic password, only works up to 10 times, but I never got feedback from them, so I sent them the serial number of my test devices and they never answered me. So I don't know how this dynamic password feature works, but uh, it sounds very suspicious. Yeah, but the attack I was able to pull off is this one. Um, here you can see the hardware layout, and the suspicious thing was this high-speed analog switch that I have um, here. And this high-speed analog switch is connected to the data lines of the USB. So it switches between um, data lines. And here we have an unmarked chip. This one is uh, responsible also for the uh, pin input. And what I realized is that it's possible to form a so-called uh, chip swapping attack. <laughs> so what I did is I bought two devices. One device is attacker controlled. I set a pin on this device with, yeah, um, uh, with a known yeah, configuration. And then I had a target device. There I set another pin. And then I simply desoldered the chip from both devices, put the attacker controlled chip on uh, my target device, and then I was able to unlock the device with uh, the correct decrypted data. So here there is no key der derivation going on with the user input as we've seen in the previous example, but yeah, we have some kind of other key management. I don't know how it's done um, in those black boxes we have here as chips. Yeah, but it's insecure. Simple chip solving attack. So the paperclip hack concerning the analog switch didn't um, work out because I think if it's possible to switch um, the data lines, it will also be possible to unlock it, maybe, but I, I couldn't figure it out. Okay, yeah, and there, of course, is an authentication um, bypass attack. So on this slide, you can see all the found security vulnerabilities. Actually, there were only six, but um, several devices affected. I think six devices um, in total with the corresponding uh, CVE IDs. So it's just for reference. Um, here are the, no, uh, seven. <laughs> it were seven security issues. So here are the seven CVE IDs and affected devices uh, concerning my research. Um, yeah. And concerning vendor and manufacturer feedback, I didn't get any directly, um, but Verbatim released security updates at the end of July. Um, and I had a look two weeks ago, or yeah, two and a half weeks ago, at the updates only briefly. And 
what they did is they released a Windows updater tool with some new device firmware for specific or for different vulnerable devices. Um, and here is the example for the Verbatim Keypad Secure we've seen uh, previously. So there's a lot of software. It is also interesting to analyze this software a little further because maybe bad USB devices using malware are now possible. If you know how to program the spy flash memory chip or the firmware via Windows system, <laughs> because I had to use a programmer and do it physically, now I can maybe program the firmware using a USB flasher tool um, in software. But I haven't had a look uh, here. Yeah, and what I found out it, uh, is that they have fixed some of the issues, but not all of them. So um, what they fixed is the AES ECP encryption mode. They now are using AES XTS, so a more secure encryption mode is actually designed for this kind of storage devices. Uh, the firmware manipulation is still possible, but I think they cannot fix this um, due to the hardware they are using. The yeah, microcontroller does not support any of these features. They have also fixed, at least for now, the brute force attack um, I have shown you, at least in the video, because they switched to AES XTS and they changed the pin code verification mechanism. And I haven't figured out yet how it now works, but in principle, you just have to uh, find out what they are now doing with the hard hardware AES encryption engine and reproduce it in yeah, your C code and then you have an offline brute force attack again. Online brute force is now already possible if you are willing to patch the firmware or write your own firmware and use the hardware AES encryption engine um, yeah, on a live device. But uh, I don't have a programmer's manual, so it's very cumbersome to yeah, program such a firmware for this uh, uh, encryption engine. Yeah, and concerning the lockout, uh, I was surprised they also did not fix this. So I bought new devices uh, three weeks ago and tested the manual brute force attack and after 20 failed consecutive login attempts and even 30 and 40, the device does not lock and does not reset. So it's still not fixed. I don't know why. And concerning the executive fingerprint secure, um, they have only fixed um, the password retrieval attack that we've seen. So if I send a specific command, this command is not supported anymore by the firmware, uh, luckily. Yeah, but all the other issues we have they have not fixed even the AES ECB encryption for the user data, and I don't know why, because they fixed it for another device, but not for this one. I don't know. Yeah, but these are my, my current results concerning the July patch. Yes, so I'm almost out of time. So there was also an interesting um, yeah, web find. Um, so this was the Amazon storage um, for the executive fingerprint, uh, Amazon store with the executive fingerprint secure uh, storage that I've bought, uh, 106 euros um, it did cost. And I could also find some other sources where I can get the same enclosure for uh, a lower price, but without the actual SSD storage, if I would buy uh, 1,000 pieces. So yeah, at global sources, you can find different devices that are just rebranded for different uh, vendors, actually. And the same with uh, this keypad enclosure that is also used by Verbatim, for instance. So here are my conclusions, new portable storage devices um, with actually old security issues that have been known for at least one and a half decades or even longer are still produced today and also sold. Uh, sold. And some of those security issues are hard or even impossible to fix concerning the uh, hardware design that is used. So there may be forever bugs concerning some of those devices that have been sold the last couple of years uh, that may affect the device until its end of yeah, life, actually. So one of my recommendations for users, yeah, um, if you're going to buy portable secure storage devices, yeah, choose them wisely. Perform a thorough online research uh, before buying such a product. <laughs> um, and if you buy them in yeah, large quantities, do it even more so. <laughs> uh, do not have faith in the product certificates and marketing claims that you can find on the vendors or manufacturers um, yeah, website. And it's always a good idea to ask for further security testing beyond some yeah, certificates they, uh, you may receive. And also very important, the scope of the performed tests because yeah, that's very critical. Yeah, and for manufacturers and vendors, also some recommendation, yeah, check your product for security issues. Um, before producing or mass producing them and selling them. So when you have a prototype, just ask some knowledgeable IT professionals to have a look at 
uh, your stuff uh, concerning all cryptography, it's a good idea to hire actual cryptographers because they know what they are doing, hopefully. <laughs> Um, I would also like to see that um, manufacturers of such devices publish their crypto design so that it's yeah, just known and not a black box until somebody does the reverse engineering and finds out how it actually works. Um, and it's also important to think of the product as a whole, so you have to think of your soft firm and hardware if you have all these components like this, executive fingerprint secure, for instance. Yeah, and generally a good idea is also refrain from false marketing claims so military grade and unhackable and stuff like that. So maybe it's not true when someone takes a closer look. Okay, here are some references. So thank you very much for your attention. That's it. Okay, time for questions. I may ask the first one if there are none, but all right, while I'm walking, are there any other manufacturers that you've tested? And if so, can you recommend to us any certain brands? Or I think currently I cannot recommend <laughs> one of them. I have tested other devices. Um, I have some devices where maybe more sophisticated attacks may be useful, like glitching, like we've seen yesterday with uh, SpaceX dishes. <laughs> yeah. And I've also tested other devices with fingerprint sensors, and I didn't have a closer look at how those sensors work, how AES keys are derivated from the user input. Yeah, it's also very new for me, and I'm learning new stuff there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just got a question about the uh, USB uh, drives who had the client installed. Um, mm -hmm. You took a look on the possibility to, get, to retrieve the key uh, by sending a certain command and getting yeah. the key. Uh, did you also try to um, use the commands uh, post-authentication and see if they were available before you were authenticated? Um, do you mean if the data itself was available before authentication? Well, for example, if you want to read, uh, you, want, you want to read in fingerprints, um, you need to authenticate, and then those API or those calls are available. And um, uh, mm -hmm. if you did not authenticate, were also uh, those calls available? I didn't have a look into this. And concerning the fingerprint authentication, this was performed completely in hardware, so the software was not involved there. So there was a different microcontroller for the fingerprint sensor, and you have both authentication methods uh, yeah, using hardware-based fingerprint authentication or the password. And the USB communication also uh, only um, is used when using the client software and not the fingerprints. So you can also unlock the device without any Windows or Mac software, um, only by touching it. Yeah. I think you're out of time. Go in once, go in twice. One more? <laughs> I, I will just say I'm a little glad that the live demo didn't work because in the video you could see your uh, custom, your hardware setup, which we couldn't see when you were holding. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, but it's the same hardware setup I have here. It's just an external enclosure, for instance, and yeah. a cable, and that's it. So very it's, cool. it's very simple. Nice and work. it should be reproducible. So if you're interested in all the information, it should be in the slides to reproduce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome.